Welcome everyone. My name is Robert Sellers and I'm the Chief Diversity Officer here at the University of Michigan. Thank you for joining us for this constructive conversation for social change. This virtual town hall is an opportunity for our community to come together to address and discuss the struggles we face and what actions we might engage to change a system and a society that has time and time again demonstrated that black dignity, black bodies and black lives matter a little less. Our conversation today marks our collective recommitment as individuals and as a university to ending systemic racism in our society and within our own institution. In, do so, in doing so, we emphatically affirm that Black lives matter. We recognize that this conversation is not the solution, nor can it be our response, our only response, to the senseless killing of George Floyd and far too many other African Americans. It's only a necessary start to acknowledging our collective pain and outrage, identifying strategic and effective ways forward and bridging our resolve to action. Today's conversation is being live streamed on YouTube. The link is available in the Q&A. Participants can use the Q&A throughout the discussion to submit your questions uh, to the panelists. The session is closed captioned and will be recorded for those who are unable to join us live. As you can see from your screens, we have a very distinguished panel today who bring a variety of perspectives to our conversation. To get us started, I'd like to pose some questions that reflect the themes we've heard from our community. And I'll start with our uh, student panelists, uh, Darlena and Naomi. Your voices are extremely important to this conversation. And we'd like to start off with you sharing uh, your experiences and what you're hearing from your peers on our campus about the need for societal change, as well as change at the University of Michigan to combat structural racism. Darlena, do you wanna start us off? Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Robert Sellers. Hi, everybody. My name is Darlena York, and I'm a senior here in the College of LSNA studying political science and Afro American African studies. Um, so, some of my experiences with racial inequality on campus stem back to the very first couple of weeks of my freshman year, where there was a lot of racial tension on campus. Um, students targeted the Black community immediately as soon as school started, fall 2017. There were racial slurs. Um, said against the Black community. And in response, um, my peers and I protested against it and reflected back on BBUM demands, the Black Action Movement demands, BAM 1, 2, and 3 demands that still haven't been met at that time. Um, there have been times where myself and my peers were walking out of Angel Hall or any other study place on campus late at night and either Ann Arbor PD or somebody who had that type of authority would stop us and ask if we actually went here um, under some type of suspicion. And there have been, I've had several professors um, be very insensitive to things that were going on in the real world. For example, I had a political science professor um, put out a very insensitive survey that um, offended the Black community, myself and my other peers. Um, and it makes students not want to participate in class, not want to go to class because it's very detrimental to our mental health, it's detrimental to how we want to perform in class, and it's detrimental to our overall well-being as students. Um, and I believe that some of the changes that we could make is implementing more Black faculty and staff, increasing Black students in the percentage of the attendees, reflecting the true percentage in Michigan. Um, so. A lot of my experiences um, aren't that positive when reflecting on um, racial inequality on campus. It's very exhausting as a student leader sometimes having to constantly combat those things. Naomi, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about your experience as well? Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you, sis. I'm, gonna, um, I'm Naomi Wilson. I'm a PhD candidate in education policy, and I'm an activist scholar. Um, when I'm thinking about my experiences, I think about being a community organizer. So I've been a community organizer for the past 10 years at UC Berkeley, at NYU, in my communities, um, and in Michigan. So I organize with 
parents, teachers, young, brilliant um, young people in Detroit and um, community members. And so unfortunately the things, and now I gotta talk my hands. Unfortunately, um, what we see is not new, right? It's, it's a particular moment. Um, folks have been in the house um, and um, things are being videotaped for everybody to see and it's very traumatizing. And so having been in this work for 10 years, which I'm not saying is really, really long, but it's a, a lot for me. Um, my experience and my feelings are both exhaustion to what Darlena was talking about and also just a deep, deep fire in my spirit to fight for justice and to make sure that we have change. And I know that my folks um, feel the exact same way. So when I'm thinking about what I'm hearing from my peers and community folks outside of Michigan and also at the University of Michigan, I hear three things. One, engaging in the messiness. And so um, teacher activist Marlena Zuniga, uh, Marilyn Zuniga, I wanna say her name right. Uh, there was a panel out of the Education Liberation Network that talked about, and she talked about specifically engaging in the messiness and the fact that we are, the movement sparked from George Floyd recently, but we're not talking about Breonna Taylor and we're not talking about Tony McDade. So we're not talking about the intersections of folks who are being brutally attacked and murdered in our communities, right? And so what is that? Why are we centering some voices and not centering others and other experiences? Two, get uncomfortable. I've seen in some statements that they talked about racism, which is a part of it. But Dr. Uh, Kiana Ross at a Northwestern University just wrote an op-ed in the New York Times talking about it's anti-Blackness. So be specific, anti-Blackness and white supremacy. And we have to name the things. It's not to say that racism is not here, but it's like, this is a particular um, experience towards Black people and it's anti-Blackness. And three, seeing and hearing from the young people. Young people are out here and they are doing the damn thing and they are dedicating their childhoods for justice, which in some ways, in a lot of ways, it's beautiful. And in a lot of ways, it's incredibly sad that we lift up these young folks who are out here marching and demanding for their lives to matter. And they have to do that in single digits, eight, nine, 12, 13, 16, what is that? And so I'm hearing that across all the communities and the fact that like it is both exhaustion and a deep desire for change and doing it no matter what. Thank you both. Your, your words are um, poignant, hit to the heart of the matter, um, pulls at uh, what many of us are feeling and uh, calls us uh, to actually move towards action. Uh, let me pivot a little bit. Um, public health is a major part of the national consciousness. And as we've been talking about um, uh, issues of racism, anti-Blackness, uh, uh, targeting the Black community in the context of things that we've seen on TV, uh, public health is another space that uh, um, uh, structural racism, structural anti-Blackness shows up. So. Given this, um, uh, the fact that COVID-19 is so highly in the uh, public uh, consciousness today, I'd like to turn to Dr. Anderson uh, as a faculty member in public health. Could you talk, us, talk to us a bit about the link between systemic racism and the disparate impact of COVID-19 on uh, the Black community? Certainly, thank you so much, Dr. Sellers. First and foremost, I would like to wish a happy 27th birthday to Breonna Taylor. Rest in power, beloved. So is racism a public health concern? Emphatically, yes. Two important things to understand are the role and toll of racism. With respect to the role, anti-Black racism is the systemic virus that permeates and promotes other oppressive social determinants of health like police brutality or lethality, housing segregation, inequitable schools and healthcare services. Given the two factors at play in our society right now, namely the disproportionate rate of transmission, treatment and mortality regarding COVID-19 and the unquestionable and consistent evidence demonstrating the disproportionate use of police force and lethal action toward unarmed Black people, there is no doubt that the health of Black people in, is compromised and at risk. This is the definition of a public health crisis. Secondly, the toll of racism 
is personally experienced on three levels in our mind, bodies, and expression. My work shows how racial acts exact a toll on psychological outcomes like anxiety, depression, and trauma, even if it's not personally happening to us, as is the case with so many of the virtual experiences we viewed online. Colleagues at the School of Public Health have found that our bodies also react through physiological processes like increased blood pressure, quickened heart rate, and heightened production of stress hormones, eroding our physical health and wreaking havoc on our normal stress responses, including regulated breathing, which of course ties back to COVID. Finally, we may find ourselves angry and frustrated due to racial discrimination. This anger drives us to action and effectively takes the pain from inside our bodies and minds to the same external environment, causing the pain in the first place. Ironically, such uprising is being met with pepper bullets, arrests, and chemical and inflammatory agents like tear gas, which have all been linked back to increased COVID exposure. And still, people are engaging in this activism because it facilitates systemic change and personal well being. Such uprising then to combat the compromised health outcomes of the black population is a public health solution. Indeed, without change, we are propagating, promoting and protecting the racial system. Thank you, Dr. Sellers. So what I'm hearing is it's in many ways what we're experiencing across a number of different areas of disparities. Part of the larger impact of uh, systemic racism is that it doesn't just show up in terms of um, uh, police violence. It doesn't just show up in terms of disparate outcomes uh, with respect to, to COVID. It's also linked to educational uh, disparities and outcomes and uh, 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 disparities from a public health standpoint in terms of exposures to other uh, forms of um, uh, pathogens more likely to be in uh, uh, more toxic environments in general. So when we think of Flint uh, as one example of that. And it's also powerful uh, that the act of resistance uh, while taxing is also uh, uh, seems to have a, a protective nature uh, uh, to um, a, an adaptive response uh, to the, the experiences. Uh, let me let me uh, shift gears a little bit, uh, and uh, Eddie, bring you into the conversation. And uh, as an African American man and the executive director of the Division of Public Safety and Security here at Michigan, you have a unique vantage point. Can you share with us your feelings when you view the video of the killing of uh, George Floyd, and how that influences how you run your division? And also, if you get a chance, please share your thoughts on the decisions of the University of Minnesota to cut ties with the Minneapolis Police Department and what's its relevance to the University of Michigan. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Dr. Sellers, and thanks to the panel here, some who I've uh, engaged and worked with in the past and talked to in the past. Uh, I guess I'm gonna start with, um, you asked me, how does it affect me as an African-American? And I think that as a person, you know, as a human being, when I saw the video, the first thing I thought about was just the loss of life. And I think about the loss of life and the impacts that that has directly on his family, on the, the community, on, the, on, the, on Blacks specifically. And I think about it through that lens, I think about it as a as that's somebody's son, that's somebody's uh, dad, that's a father, that's that's a that's a grandson, and and I and I think about me, I think about you know growing up in an environment where that was all too often um, the scenario, and that I think about it not just in terms of I think what Naomi talked about was like that was the spark of of, of images that that I think about. For, the, for most of my life, images from you know the '60s and the '70s, and um, and then and then I think about it again as a father and as an uncle, you know, and as a son, and 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 I think about it also as a 
as the executive director of public safety, as a person who for all, all of those of the opposite reasons is why I've done what I've done, been interested in doing what I, what I do for 50 years and doing it for over 40 is, is, to, is, to, is to change those images. So I think about, I think about the, um, the culture of, of policing also, I think about it through the lens of how do, I think about the character of, of the officer. And I think about um, the work that we think, you know, that we've done and work that we have done, but how much work there is to do. And um, so I don't only think about loss of life, Dr. Sellers and everyone, I think about the loss, loss of trust for some, but the increase of distrust for others. So there's this, this reality that I've experienced, you know, throughout the years, throughout my different um, stops, where um, it, it, the work that we do to develop relationships, to improve our, uh, our culture, to improve the character and to improve the accountability of, of, our, of our police. Um, I, I, I can't help but to think how that creates even a, a more an unsafe communities unsafe environment um, that, you know, when I think about the, the uh, impact, again, that's one video, but it's, it's images that, again, not far, far too often are images that are too familiar in, in, in our community. And then I think about, I think about opportunities like this for me to, you know, to stop talking as an example, and just to make sure that I'm listening more than we are talking and that we do look more at you know, evidence-based, researched, informed um, solutions collectively for how we move, how we get better. Um, and so now, now I'll talk a little bit about the Minnesota uh, scenario. What I will say is that I don't know uh, um, Minnesota, uh, the, the police department of Minneapolis. I don't know the relationship that they have with their university. I know that from state to state and university to university, those relationships are different. What I can say is without, just with the same amount of confidence of what I don't know is what I do know is that in the, you know, the leadership that I, that I work with in uh, both Ann Arbor and in uh, my leadership within DPSS, the, the sheriff and the chief, that it's, it's difficult for me to talk about in a positive way in this moment, but I have to. And, and I think about the, the police officers and, and troopers that I work with um, and, and across the, the state and, and, and the dedication that they have to uh, creating a culture in their organizations, a, a, a cultural confidence, a, um, a culture of accountability, a culture of community first, of, of never stop learning, of, of how we do something better tomorrow than we did today to avoid these types of scenarios. So for me, I think about safety and security first. And I say for us to adopt a, a, a policy where Though where I say making a decision about who, you know, how we relate to other agencies, whether state, federal, or local, does that create a greater risk for our community or does it create um, lesser risk? And, and, if I, and if I felt that it, if I felt that the policies, that the culture, that the leadership, that their attitude wasn't, wasn't um, uh, you know, shared, their values weren't shared, then I would, I would, I would consider all types of options for, uh, for, for how we serve this community. But again, I'm open to listening more than talking, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Addie. Let's uh, turn to President Slissel. A question that consistently comes from the community is, beyond community discussions and public condemnations of racism, what actions has the university taken in recent years to address issues of systemic racism? And what actions do you foresee the university taking in the upcoming years? Yeah, thanks, Rob, and thanks for the invitation. And, and Darlena and Naomi, it's nice to see you. And you know, I appreciate all your ongoing hard work and to, to Eddie and, and Rihanna and others to put yourself out there and uh, help the community um, is tough and it's really appreciated. You know, my heart goes out to the families that were touched by these tragedies directly, uh, but I'm 62 years old and they're not new. You keep seeing them again and again and again. So we have enormous systemic problems without a doubt. Uh, you know, I think we have to say and say out loud that black lives matter and then end that sentence. It doesn't have to be modified, you know, black lives matter. 
we need to figure out how to make a better society and the things that are within our grasp are how to make a better university. Uh, I've been committed since I've come here to our DEI work, uh, decentralized, every unit on the campus uh, has their own plan, their own efforts. And we, I will keep my foot on the gas until the day I, I no longer have the privilege of leading the university. It, it's fundamentally important. The whole rubric of leaders and best doesn't exist unless we can build a diverse and uh, equitable community. It's just, it's literally not possible to be leaders and best uh, without this. Uh, although I experience what's gone on recently very differently than others because of my position and my privilege. Uh, I think it's fair that all of us should be held to account to take responsibility to advance justice and, and equity and peace and understanding, regardless of what perspective we come from. We could all understand those values and, and their meanings to us uh, personally. Uh, you know, we change the world through research and through education and through providing clinical care. Uh, we've not done a good enough job developing a diverse student body for sure. Uh, I agree with uh, Darlena and Naomi and, and many others who've said that uh, we should look like the state we're serving. Uh, uh, and you know we're not allowed to play numbers, but we know we're a long way away from having identified all the talented kids with black faces and black families that could come to the University of Michigan and thrive and be successful here. So we've got to get better at identifying talent coming out of um, less advantaged circumstances where the usual metrics are just harder to see. So we need new metrics. We need more things like something Rob started in his running, Wolverine Pathways, you know, reaching down into junior high schools and even earlier if we can figure out how and getting kids ready to be competitive and mentored and convince them that they can live here and they're welcome here. Uh, we've got to find more resources to extend something like the Go Blue Guarantee around the entire state of Michigan. Uh, money should never be a reason why a talented kid doesn't get uh, to be educated. Um, we need to do more research like the kind being done by the School of Education running the P20 school out at uh, Marygrove College um, with a whole curriculum that involves not just teaching uh, public school kids in Detroit, but teaching teachers how to teach in an urban setting uh, with social justice and technology as the two themes of that school. We've got to do more things like the poverty initiative embedded in the mayor's office in Detroit, trying to solve the scourge of intergenerational poverty, which is inextricably linked to systemic racism that holds down many people through many generations. Uh, so the list of things we need to do is really long. Um, the moment feels discouraging. Uh, to me, the sources of optimism are looking at the faces of the people who are protesting in the street. And they're not just black faces, they're American faces. And I think this is really a moment that's captured everybody's consciousness and touched our souls and have made us come together to identify more than words, but tangible deeds, ways of living and concrete things we can all do together. So uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Mark. One thing I just wanna add um, before we uh, jump to our uh, uh, next question, and, um, and to uh, bring in Eugene, is Mark referenced the uh, DEI um, uh, commitment, the university's efforts to, to make change, uh, broad change with smack dab in the middle of it, um, uh, opportunities for uh, African-Americans and to make sure that uh, they have access and opportunities to the university or that we have access to opportunities to the university to be able to um, contribute. In that time, we have made progress. We have created an infrastructure. We've created a um, uh, commitment uh, that has the potential uh, to do big things, but we, we haven't anywhere near reached um, where we need to go as a society, as Mark had said, and where we need to go as an institution. What I hope is that as we take this moment uh, to build our resolve and our commitment 
uh, uh, to make a change that we also utilize and build on some of the progress that we've already made as we also view new opportunities and create new uh, efforts. In other words, I hope we don't um, uh, jump to a nihilistic view that we have done nothing or we can do nothing uh, and that we need to throw away uh, the baby with the bathwater. Uh, Mr. Sellers, may I make a very please. quick please. comment? I, I, I apologize, um, no, I, no, I, I wanted to say something with respect to uh, something that President Schlissel just indicated, which is looking out into the protest, we see myriad faces, right? Um, I want to underscore that Black Americans are Americans. And that, that was something that um, didn't sit very well with me when you indicated that we see American faces out there. If we continue to otherize or dehumanize or create this segregation that Black people are not a part of this American thread, this is how the systemic practices continue because we don't see them like us. And so I really just want to underscore that everyone, including Black Americans, are protesting and all of us as Americans are taking up the charge to fight against the systemic oppression. Thanks, Rihanna. That's exactly what I meant, is that we're seeing American faces in their full breadth of diversity. We're seeing everybody, uh, all of the images I see on TV are black and brown and, and gay and straight and men and women and children and adults and old people. That's America, everybody under that tent. We're all in this together. We can't succeed without each other. Thank you. Thank you. Eddie. As an African, I'm sorry, I jumped uh, back to a, another question. I'm sorry, I had jumped past you, Eugene. My apologies. No problem. Uh, the arts have always played an uh, important role in the struggle for social justice, uh, both a direct as well as indirect role uh, to combat uh, systemic racism and anti-Black racism in particular. As a conductor of the U of M uh, Chamber Choir, you've co-created a resource to help communities engage in important conversations such as this one that we're having right now. Could you please talk a bit about the, the seven last words of the unarmed, uh, why it's so important, where did it um, uh, uh, come from, and where do you hope it uh, uh, helps to lead us? Sure, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Rob, for having me be a part of this. Um, for those of you who don't know the work, The Seven Last Words of the Unarmed was a powerful composition by the arts activist and composer Joel Thompson, um, uh, who was inspired by Sheeran Bargi's Last Words Project that uses the seven last words of Kenneth Chamberlain, Trayvon Martin, Amadou Diallo, Michael Brown, Oscar Grant, John Crawford, and Eric Garner. I like to say all those names because sometimes we can forget. And, uh, who were all killed by police and authority figures. And uh, it's interesting talking about how um, we see that Black voices are a part of American voices. And that's exactly uh, what I think I'm most encouraged by right now. Because when I chose to premiere this work in 2015, it was five years ago, it was still a time when many were scared to even use the words Black Lives Matter. Uh, I was deliberate in not doing that because I know that some of my students have mixed feelings. The community was not ready. And I had even some alumni who asked me, why would I program a piece about thugs? And even in performance had people who would literally stand up, visibly rip the program to shreds and throw it in the trash. And so for me, uh, there are many mixed emotions right now, uh, have range from being of course, angry and sad and hopeful uh, that uh, this country is not just a movement, right? That the last 10 days, that this is actually our country finally standing up and dealing with the hardest. And that's really to me what uh, the arts can do. For those who did listen at that time, I think I was most moved by how the arts and music in this instance, instance became an entry and star a starting point for some of the hardest conversations, especially when it comes to racism uh, and police reform. Um, and I more than ever, I want to encourage our U of M community and alumni who want to engage with this composition that, that's, that has really reverberated around the world right now that deals with this issue um, of racism and police reform to look at 
uh, the resources, the, the educational resources created by Margot Schlanger and the law school and Darren Stockfield in the School of Education to really help folks begin this conversation about uh, change. And, and that needs to happen in our classrooms, our workplaces, uh, and places of worship. And so um, this work was, uh, uh, it's hard to believe really that it was five years ago and now we're revisiting it. But I think it's very relevant to today to help people process and be active, really actively engaged. Eugene, I had the uh, uh, privilege of participating in a uh, session yesterday with the uh, provost office uh, that was uh, put on by our uh, DEI committee within the provost office. And the piece was used to stimulate um, uh, first sharing uh, and uh, then a set of conversations that were um, extremely impactful. And uh, so I just want to give that uh, personal testimony about the uh, uh, impact of the, the piece. And if anyone out there hasn't um, uh, experienced it, because it's not about seeing it or hearing it, it's about experiencing it, I um, strongly encourage you to, but I also put a trigger warning on it. It is, um, it is difficult as it is meant to be. Absolutely. Now, um, let's uh, uh, turn our attention to some specific questions that have been submitted in advance from our community. We asked uh, 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 folks of the community to submit uh, uh, questions uh, prior to the session. We've received uh, over 150, and I'd like to try to get through uh, a couple of those uh, and then save some time to get to uh, uh, perhaps a couple uh, that have uh, just come up today. Uh, the first one, uh, and I'm gonna uh, start uh, with uh, either Darlena or Naomi and others, everybody else feel free to jump in. Uh, the first question is how can we best show our support, especially for our students uh, during this time? Uh, I would add virtually, uh, or otherwise, given the, the current context with respect to, to COVID? Um, I think the best way to, so, to show support for students is professors being more empathetic to students, um, being more understanding of the times without the students having to over communicate. I've had um, some peers especially during the spring term, there has been a lot of going on during spring term, communicate with their professors that they're not, uh, their mental health is in question. They need a little bit of extra time on a certain assignment or a certain exam or whatever. And profess some professors are empathetic and some are not, and some don't allow that extension. And I think that's not okay because um, students shouldn't have to overshare personal information to sometimes professors who they don't have a professional relationship with to understand that this is a difficult time with whatever they may be struggling with, whether it's COVID-19 or anything to do with the Black Lives Matter protests, professors should be understanding of what's going on in today's climate and be able to be the first step and send an email or reach out personally to students and say, I understand what's going on, please take your time it shouldn't have to come from the students first. Okay. Thank you, uh, Naomi. Yes, I wanna add to that. Um, like I like old school spirit from my parents, rest in power to both of them. Um, actions and words, actions and words. And so we have these panels, which are great. Um, it's only an hour, so that's limited a lot. You know, I understand schedules and the things, but now let's move into action. I think the best way to support is by what you do as an institution, right? So we have our programs. Let's talk about, you know, how are we increasing mental health resources? We've been talking about this for years, being former RSG president for two, two terms. I know very much how that process goes, but that has been something that folks have advocated for a long time. Not only more CAP services, but more um, therapists who are of color, who are black. And that's incredibly important, especially in this time. Like you wanna talk to somebody who deeply understands. Um, thinking about how are we promoting and also supporting with our funds and our dollars. I know that institutions across the nation in my networks with folks who are organizing on the ground and both at their um, universities are calling on for 
administration to be like, this is what we support. We are putting money towards bail funds, for instance, right? For folks who are being arrested for protesting. Um, and, you know, how are we also supporting um, with people's legal cases and also thinking about people who are here at the university. I'm talking undergraduate students and I'm talking graduate students who have been doing this work too, right? And how are we paying them and doing things like teach outs? It's an old organizing thing. Right, and so not only are we asking on folks to teach each other, but also paying folks for doing that labor. Anyone else want to jump in? I'll briefly indicate to Darlena's point, um, something that the ISR, the Institute for Social Research put out just the other day on an infographic was that the disparity between black and white Detroiters who know someone who passed from COVID is four to one. So if you are a black Detroiter, you are 40 to 50% likely to know someone who has died from COVID relative to an eight to 11% range for white Detroiters. That's Detroiter. So we know Detroit is a hot spot. So to Darlena's point, when I am on faculty meetings and I don't get a beat to, to express how it is that I am feeling and um, getting an opportunity to reflect on what's going on. It's to me because there's such a lack of awareness of what is possibly happening in other people's lives. And th these are all psychological principles that we can pull from in empathy or building awareness. But if the university doesn't even use its own resources like teaching faculty that there are people who are experiencing death rates from COVID or transmission, et cetera, or who are out in these streets protesting at rates that are greater than other people, thus your students might be the ones that are impacted by this. You need to have an awareness and a, a uh, space for those students to have a response or re recover or just feel, right? If the faculty aren't aware or knowledgeable, then they too are gonna fall short in doing what Darlena and, and Naomi are requesting. So I think that the, the university in having these resources really needs to demonstrate and teach the faculty how they can better support the students because right now we're living in two different worlds. And I would just also add that, you know, I think it's, it's, it's crucially important for faculty to constantly look at how they teach and what, what is available to their students that may, be, that may have implicit bias. I think we, we often don't realize if we, yes, we've got our syllabi and we've taught this class always this way, but what way is that information being executed that's still constantly perpetuating this bias? And I, I just think the more faculty can raise that awareness, students of color don't want to be seen as a melting pot. I think that is the worst thing you can say is I see all my students the same. That is, that is implicitly racist. Students want to be seen as individuals who bring a variety of cultural backgrounds and experiences. And I know that's common language. Everybody knows it, but I don't see it always in practice. I would encourage my colleagues to think more this way. So one thing I would... Um echo in that is I think we also have to, as we think about the, the change that we want to make, is be very clear that if we can't teach everybody, then we can't teach. If we're studying uh, a particular um, field and we're supposed to be teaching that field and that field only has one perspective, then uh, not only do uh, those of us who are left out lose out, but the field is suspect. The field loses out. The discipline lo loses out. Um, uh, so that's one thing that we've been uh, working to do. And there are resources on campus and that's one of the struggle. There are resources that are attempting to address these exact same issues out of the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching, uh, some of the work with the uh, Inclusive uh, Teaching Initiative. And one of the struggles is how do we um, uh, scale up uh, the effort such that uh, everyone uh, gets that same experience. Let me move on to uh, another uh, question uh, from the, the group. Um, this is one that's come from the community. Uh, how can we engage effectively with people 
who aren't interested in learning, discussing, or expanding their views and think that they are not a part of the problem or that the problem is not real. Anyone want to start off with that one? Eugene, you want, since I, I uh, overlooked you earlier, uh, <laughs> so that you're well, right. Sure. I mean, I think, you know, for me, engagements with the arts, I, I believe arts absolutely is a way to begin these critical conversations because sometimes words fail us. People, but the heart, the art sometimes will just uh, open the door in a way or help us look at the, at this issue or these issues from a different perspective. And so I'm gonna start there. I always think the arts are a way to engage people who are not open to that. Others, Eddie or uh, uh, Mark, do you wanna jump in? Or for that matter, I'm sorry, I, I might've cut you off, Darlene. Oh, no problem. Um, one of my ideas that has been talked about amongst my peers, um, the race and ethnicity requirement in the school, in the College of LSNA, is very is easily satisfied. A lot of times students can take a random linguistics class that really has nothing to do with the purpose of race and ethnicity and it'll satisfy that degree requirement. I think that increasing or changing that requirement, taking a 300 or 400 level course that actually talks about the problems in the black community. For example, Vonnie McLeod's class talks about the life of the black child and in that class she discusses systemic racism, oppression, the fact that black women are more likely to have higher maternity mortality rates, things like that need to be discussed in class and required for a degree so that they're forced to be in those spaces and in those uncomfortable positions and in those uncomfortable um, discussions so that it takes the pressure off black and brown students having to always relate these messages because that too is exhausting for professors and faculty and staff to always ask the first question to the black student, well, what do you think? That's not, it's very exhausting. I think we need to work harder to make it so there isn't just one black student in a class with 15 or 20 having a discussion. Uh, you know, I've talked to so many who say how hard it is to have a professor look at you and expect you to be representative of everyone who looks like you. And you know, that's unfair inherently, uh, and it's just bad teaching. Uh, but you know, one thing I wanna to return to is this challenge that we've faced, and actually one of my biggest disappointments is how hard it's been to move the needle on the percentage of black students, especially in uh, the undergraduate community all across the campus, but particularly undergraduate community, where it's gone down by about a half since the implementation of proposal two. Uh, so uh, that's the law. So we need to be smarter about ways to grow the black student population uh, within the confines of the law. And I think what that means is we need to develop better ways to identify and mentor talented kids uh, who want to go to college and can see themselves here. And I, I talked earlier about a couple of those ways, but also we need to do a lot of work. And, and I think Darlena and Naomi, you've both told me this on multiple occasions about what the lived experience is like on campus so that you can be advocates in your own community and good cautious telling uh, neighbors and friends and, and, and extended family, you know, come to Michigan. It's a great place. It'll change your life. Uh, and you know, I think if we don't do both of those things, you know, find ways to identify and cultivate talent way down in the, in the public schools, and then find ways to change the lived experience for Black students on campus, uh, I don't think we're going to reach that uh, level of representativeness that's important to improve everyone's quality of experience. And when it comes to faculty as well, we've had some success recently, uh, but you know it's, it hasn't nearly been enough. Uh, I think uh, LSA has introduced a great postdoc program uh, that's becoming a pipeline to the faculty from more diverse scholars. Uh, brilliant idea, big investment, but I think it's paying off. We've got to keep pushing hard on that. Uh, but I think it changes the whole environment when you see more diversity in front of the classroom it's easier to be uh, members of different communities inside the classroom. And then finally, you know, we have this great center for research on learning and teaching, and they do have great programs on pedagogy, on issues of race and, and, and uh, uh, an equitable classroom and inclusive classroom. Uh, we have to find ways to get more faculty to take those classes. Um, you know, we've done this when it comes to sexual misconduct. We've, we've required all faculty now uh, to take, all new faculty and 
We'll work on all existing faculty to take uh, uh, courses to help understand sexual misconduct and what their obligations are. And you know, we should think about ways to uh, uh, spread across the whole faculty a responsibility to educate yourself as a teacher for the methods that Eugene and um, you know, Rihanna were, were talking about a minute ago. I also want to quickly add um, some things. So I want to lift up again. I know, Rob, you've been talking about CRLT. CRLT is amazing and also Ginsburg Center. Um, and so like the trainings and teachings um, about these type of discussions and how you go about that, the facilitation is incredibly important. And I want to quickly offer a radical idea that Dr. Bettina Love has talked about when we brought her, we being School of Education, had a colloquium in September. And she straight up was like this. There's one third of folks who are down, ready to do the work and are out here. And there's one third of folks who do not wanna be engaged at all, don't care, don't think it matters. There's one third of folks who are on the cusp, who want to be involved, who wanna be engaged, who wanna learn better, but they, are, they don't know how and they don't know where to go. Those are the people we need to focus on. That's what, that's what Dr. Love says. That's the people that we need to engage with better. I think we focus all our efforts on the people who really just don't care. One, that is like so violent to our spirits. And then two, it's like, I, I, no. Like that's not saying to completely push them away, but I think for our intents and purposes and the times that we're at, let's focus on that third who's right there, who's like, I want to know, I want to do better. How can you help me? And those are the spaces we need to curate for folks. Thank and you. briefly, Naomi, that was fantastic. Briefly, I, I think it's incredibly important to say, um, I was in this same situation as an undergrad at the University of Michigan 14 years ago when we were trying to get prop to um, defeated in, in the state of Michigan. So, you know, it's, there are 14 year gaps that because of the death of one person, now we're talking about these issues that that's 14 years of people, someone who could have been in kindergarten when Prop 2 was being discussed, who could now be a University of Michigan Wolverine as we speak, who was not there because we haven't thought about it's not just high school, it's not just junior high school. These are problems that are inherent systemically over time before a child is even born. And we have way too many scholars at the University of Michigan who know this, who study this, who do things about it. And all the things that we've talked about today are fantastic. Let's get a systemic plan for how we can not let 14 more years go by, not let another generation of kindergartners who could now be excelling at the University of Michigan who are not there. Here, here. Uh, we and are also uh, about to head into a, an air, a time of bigger risk, Rihanna because of the state's economy right now. So, um, you know, with this massive unemployment, again, disproportionately affecting sub-communities and the black community for sure, um, education's about to be cut again. It always happens, right? You know, higher ed's gonna be cut again. Public schools are gonna be cut again. Uh, families don't have the money to, to help their kids pursue higher ed. Uh, so uh, that's gonna make uh, all of our efforts um, just that much more challenging at a very unwelcome time. And at the risk of, of making it um, more complex and uh, uh, providing people with outs not to do anything, uh, I think it's very important as we uh, talk about this, that we talk about the fact that this is systemic and this is the, the, the systemic nature of the inequalities extends not only at the university, but beyond the University of Michigan. So if you look at what happened to Detroit and Rihanna growing up in Detroit, what happened to Detroit over the past 20 years is uh, uh, akin uh, to genocide in terms of you look at what happened to Detroit public schools, the educational opportunities, what happened to the black community, uh, how it was starved in many ways, how um, uh, you basically have uh, uh, a generation of folks denied tremendous uh, opportunities. It's a different place uh, now than when you were there and it's definitely a different place than uh, when I grew up. And that has consequences. Uh, and in order to make those changes, we have to attack this at a systemic level. It goes uh, uh, beyond individual um, actions of uh, anti-bias, uh, which are important or part of the answer, but is nowhere near the answer. 
so I just want to make sure that we, we put a, a pin in that. Um, unfortunately, we have time for one very quick question uh, that is live. Uh, and I'm going to ask for uh, a very quick set of answers, uh, a, a very quick, <laughs> quick answer from um, uh, each of us. How will the University of Michigan maintain accountability for the commitments and change proposed uh, for the U of M community? Who will be held accountable and how frequently will this accountability occur? I feel like everyone's looking at me even though I can't tell who's looking at who. <laughs> well, let's start, yeah, let's start well, with you. You know, ultimately I'm accountable and the Board of Regents are accountable. Uh, and, you know, I accept that it's part of my job. Uh, I work closely with, you know, you, Rob, but it's not just you. Just because we have a chief diversity officer, one person isn't going to change the University of Michigan. It's a collective action problem. And I think, you know, we all need to be responsible and held, hold one another responsible. Uh, you know, we put out our data on students and faculty and demographic data. We're gonna repeat the cultural survey, Rob, that you did several years ago when we were just starting our DEI work and look hard to see areas where we've improved and areas where we haven't improved and you know, change what we do with a DEI 2.0 effort to give things another push. Uh, but you know, ultimately I'm accountable. And one of the ways I'm held accountable is by students like Darlena and Naomi and many others that I meet with from time to time, year after year uh, telling us, you know, what we're doing that works, but more importantly, you know, what we're doing that doesn't work and the problems that, that we haven't seen solutions for. Uh, and to do so, you know, not in a, in a way that gives us a pass, but in a way that says, look, this isn't working. We want to work on this together. And, you know, some of the issues that uh, uh, these uh, students brought up, uh, we were talking about these five years ago. So that's part of the frustration is a lot of them you know, maybe they're getting better around the edges, but we've got a lot more work to do and we do have to hold ourselves to account and the buck, you know, stops with me and the board and it requires the help of a lot of people. Anyone else want to jump in on this? Um, I'll, I'll talk, uh, Rob. I'll just say from, from uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm part of the University of Michigan, that I am, you know, that my role and my responsibility here is to make sure that everyone not only is safe, but that they feel safe, that they feel that they're being served um, by a, a functional area that, that takes seriously that the oath to protect and to serve. And so I would say a concrete for me is that I, I offer and pledge accessibility and um, you know, to me, and I would uh, ask for you know, where there is uh, you know, I feel like we need to get vulnerable as a profession. I think that that doesn't lessen our credibility. But for me, what I've learned in, in these types of settings is uh, where we've um, identified our, our uh, blind spots within the profession and we've, we've tried to be educated to it. Um, you know, working with you, Ra, we, we've talked a lot about those opportunities in existing groups and, and the difficulty sometimes of having someone like me in the room and how that, how that, uh, how that kind of uh, dampens the communication. Um, it, it's, 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 it, create, it, 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 it increases anxiety. Um, and, and I would say that it, it's in, and not only in, at university, but in my travels, in my journey, what I found is that communities that uh, are willing to, to uh, allow those of us who I know, the thousands of us who, who really do believe in what we do and why we do it, if we're allowed to be in the room and allowed to, to listen and talk, and be part of, be partners with uh, being better tomorrow, that, that I, I offer that. I, I think that the accountability is with us to our communities and our communities, uh, I mean, with our communities, our communities with us. And, and, I, and I stand ready and I know that uh, my entire agency who are people that wake up every day wanting to, you know, wanting to do the right thing. I want to add, I think that a part of this question too is like tangibility, right? And so a lot of folks are like, you have, um, these type of discussions and then we walk away with 
what? Like, what, what are you going to do? What are you going to address? And so I think a part of it is give people tangibles. So come back, whoever, you know, discuss and give us a plan. What y'all going to do? Like, it, and when, and they ask frequency. So are you going to email us, you know, let us know, update us every three months, you know, come up with that and tell us and be, and the biggest part of this all is transparency. I know, um, having been a part of this university for five years and on my way out, doctor next year, 2021, um, Oh, had to get that out there, um, is that uh, there is some beautiful work done both in the communities and also on the university, but it's not always shown. People don't know because they don't know where to find it. So the more we can be transparent about the moves and actions y'all are making and also give us the dates, you know, let us know when we can hold you accountable to what you said you were going to tell us and update us, the more people will feel like, okay, you're moving. And I would just add that, you know, I, tangibility is so key. If every school and college can say, we're going to commit to this one focus this year in this specific area and really go after that. I mean, sometimes we can try to do a million things and accomplish nothing, but one or two goals or focuses that we're going to make really implement throughout our faculty and students, I just think that's better if we can do that. Uh, and I think if every college and school would commit to that we will see some change. I want to quickly just support both what Naomi and Eugene indicated and maybe use some um, terms that'll stick with folks a bit. So you can be in your level and your lane. So those are our alliterations. I want you to stay at a place where you know you can affect change. You don't have to jump to a system that you're not familiar with. So stick to your level and your lane, which means that every single one of us listening right now, every single one of this, us on this panel can do something in our ability and in our skill sets. And then we have to walk or talk, walk and chalk. So we can have these conversations right here and we can, you know, I, I think that's important as a therapist who thinks about trauma focused representation, we need to be aware of the traumas and the triggers that are going on. That's, that's not chopped liver. So we have to start with the talk. Then we have to walk out that talk. So what does it look like again in our lane and our level to be able to do some of these things in our classrooms or in our applied work? And then the chalk is the policy. So again, going back to President Schlissel, this, you know, what is it that we can get on paper? What, it, what policy initiative systemic change can we enact based on the things that we know how to do and based on our level. So I'm looking forward to seeing those things come out with the frequency and regularity that, that people are yearning for. Darlene, did I interrupt you or did you wanna jump? I would just echo everything that everybody else um, just said, just making sure that you're constantly keeping in contact with students and different student leaders, making sure that our voices are heard and that our experience our experiences aren't silenced and that everybody is aware of socially what's happening in the world, not just on campus. So I wanna thank the, the panel um, and uh, I uh, deeply appreciate uh, your participation, uh, the, the wisdom that you shared, the uh, perspective and the um, point forward uh, for us to move as a community, a university uh, community. I'm afraid we've reached the one o'clock um, period. Um, and uh, I just wanna say that this is just the beginning of the conversations about uh, committing to ending racism on this campus in, in our society. There are many more uh, conversations that are taking place across campus even now. I want to call your attention to a couple in particular. So Rackham Graduate School is sponsoring a lead discussion on Friday, June 12th from 12 to 1 p.m. Uh, this event is being organized specifically uh, by Debbie Willis, Debbie Willis, who has uh, been a, a huge champion uh, to moving these uh, issues forward for a very long time. And on Monday, June 8th, um, uh, from 12 to 1, the Office of Health Equity and Inclusion, uh, OHE, is hosting the first of three virtual forums on racial disparities uh, with the Michigan medicine community. So I strongly encourage uh, us to, uh, as a community, to participate in those discussions. 
as uh, Naomi and many others have said, um, uh, as we engage in these uh, dialogues, we also must commit to engage in action. Um, for those of us out there who may be struggling to figure out how you can address such a large problem as systemic racism, uh, I think you need to start by asking yourself these questions and then committing to uh, actions around them. What is one thing that you're willing to do personally to address your own uh, racial bias and your own opportunity to improve the lives uh, of African Americans? Do not ask anybody to do something that you're not willing to do personally. What is one thing that you're willing to do to engage at least one other person to address their own racial bias, to address what they're doing with regards to uh, improving the lives of African Americans? You can't do this alone. You need other people with you. So how do you create your um, uh, own posse to move things forward? Third, what is one thing that you're willing to do to fight systemic racism in your school or your workplace? Again, it's one thing to call on the University of Michigan to change. But if you call on the University of Michigan to make this change and you wanna hold the University of Michigan accountable and you do that with the view that says you're not the University of Michigan, that you want other people to come back to you and tell you what they have done, then you've already given up the University of Michigan as your institution. So reframing that question, what can we do to make the University of Michigan a better place? And what am I committed to do to making sure that we hold us accountable? Fourth, what is one thing that you're willing to do to fight systemic racism in your own community? What are you willing to do as you look outside your window and you see kids walking uh, uh, across the street? How are you willing to make your community better? And then last, what is one thing, one thing that you're willing to do to fight systemic racism in our country? It's not enough to complain it's not enough to be upset. The question is, what are you willing to do? We all have a role to play. Unfortunately, the struggle continues. It's a long one and there'll be a long one uh, to go in the future. But I do have hope, particularly when I uh, hear from folks like Darlena and Naomi about what that future is actually gonna look like because they're gonna be the ones along with us that are gonna continue that battle long after we're gone and how are we gonna help them in winning that struggle. Thank you and go blue. Thanks Rob.